Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our CFP Board's Business Update Webinar. I am Tom Howard, and I'm pleased to be moderator for today's event. For those of you who may not know me, I'm a second career planner who earned his certification by passing the Fall 2004 exam. I've been in financial services since 1997 and have a practice and partnership in Elgin, Illinois. I'm a past president of FPA Illinois, and I'm very thankful for the colleagues and mentors I've found in the CFP and FPA communities. My practice has been built upon the fiduciary standard and is greatly appreciated by my clients. Today we will hear updates from the latest Board of Directors meeting. We will take a look at CFP Board's overarching outcomes with the AGRA strategic plan focused on awareness, growth, recognition and regulation, and authority. We will cover updates on the DOL fiduciary rule, CFP Board's Commission on Standards, and the new Center for Financial Planning. And we'll also be addressing questions from the audience. Before we get into today's presentation, let me cover a few housekeeping topics. If you run into issues with the audio for this presentation, or if it seems like the slides are out of sync, try refreshing your webinar console. There is a Q&A function on your screen that you can use to submit questions to us at any time during the program. We'll try to address as many questions as possible during a Q&A session at the end of the program. And if we don't get to your question today during the broadcast, CFP Board will follow up to provide you an answer. Joining me on today's panel are Mike Green, the 2016 Chair of the Board of Directors, Blaine Aiken, the 2016 Chair-Elect of the Board of Directors, and Kevin Keller, CFP Board's CEO. Thank you all for joining us. We are broadcasting from Chicago's Sofitel Hotel at the Water Tower. The Board of Directors just wrapped up its latest meeting. Mike, what updates can you share about the meeting? Tom, um, thank you. Here in Chicago for the last couple of days, and it was our second in-person meeting of the year. We discovered a, a number of topics that are important to the governance of CFP Board, uh, with a primary focus this time on discussions about our overarching goals, focusing on any course corrections we might need to make in light of the current state of the industry and what's happening in the planning profession. Back in 2012, the board adopted a set of four overarching outcomes that you referenced in your opener that we call AGRA by its acronym. Now, each of those is closely related to the mission and they give focus to the work. Let me take those in turn. So awareness. Awareness includes public awareness of CFP certification, and it also involves awareness within the financial services industry and policymakers and thought leaders. Growth. Growth relates to the number of CFP professionals as well as growing diversity among the ranks of professionals because it's all about access. Recognition and regulation. Highlights of our long-term goal. This highlights the long-term goal that financial planners have had to become a recognized and regulated profession. And authority. Authority is another key way that CFP Board advances our mission to benefit the public. I want to reemphasize that, benefit the public by advancing the body of knowledge for our profession, the financial planning profession, and building the profession's capacity. We've got ambitious goals in each one of these four areas, and they focus the work over the last several years, and we've made significant achievements in each area. Let's just talk about those for a moment. Awareness. After the first four years of the public awareness campaign, we have doubled I repeat that we have doubled awareness of CFP certification among our target audience of mass affluent initiators. I'm certain that everyone on the webcast today has seen the DJ ads. Growth. The number of CFP professionals has grown by more than a third in the time that Kevin's joined us. And you're coming up on 10 years now, Kevin? 10 years, May 1st of next year. And we are fast approaching a milestone number, and um, I'm, I'm really excited about when we're going to announce that. 
You know, Mike, so we project that the we will have the 75,000th CFP professional, so we will cross the 75,000 mark probably sometime in September. It's, it's just fantastic, and it's so you know for the folks who started who are here at the beginning of the profession, just thinking about that that we're going to cross 75,000 is amazing. And growth has been a focus of our work for the last few years, and we have strong initiatives underway particularly within larger firms where we're looking to institutionalize CFP as they hire new talent into the, into the industry, into the profession, and move forward. Recognition and regulation. Didn't CFP's advocacy alone, but as part of our financial planning coalition has really raised the standing of financial planners among thought leaders and policymakers. Increasingly, what's happening is they are seeking out the Financial Planning Coalition on important issues that are facing the profession. Authority, the last A, CFP Board plays an important role in establishing and developing our body of knowledge, setting the curriculum for CFP certification. That drives the topic coverage on the exam, and both of those are driven by the job task analysis. I'm sure many folks who are on the webinar today have received that survey that we do once every five years, and it guides how we, how we drive topics. So the AGRA framework has been extremely effective for us in developing the strategic plan, and we've accomplished much towards these goals. Now, later this year, we will finalize what we have come to be call AGRA 2.0. We've been on an almost year-long journey now to reevaluate that as we look at our outcomes and look towards the future, what we need as a board and what we need to support the profession. We're going to keep you very well informed through these webinars and other communications as we go forward. Now, Tom, the other thing that I'm really excited about that we did while we were here in Chicago is that we had a chance to meet with senior executives, senior leaders out of FPA, Financial Planning Association. So Pam Sandy was in town and Lauren Shadle spent some time with us, the CEO. And we're, we work so closely with FPA in a whole host of issues. And CFP is, we just want to let people know that we appreciate all of the work that FPA does, whether that's at the national level or the local level. Tom, I salute you for all of the work that you've done at the local level in support of CFP professionals through the association. I want to thank them for their partnership in the coalition as well. FPA has very strong programming that supports the work of professionals. Their annual conference just around the corner in Baltimore is the largest gathering for CFP professionals. That's September 14th through 16th. So be on the watch for that. If you're not attending, you'll see the reports as they come out of that meeting. It was an important chance for us to get together face-to-face -face with the leadership. In fact, next week, this meeting will continue and expand as Lauren is bringing her executive team to Washington, D.C. to meet with Kevin and team as we continue to deepen our relationship together. I want folks to hear me really clearly on this one. Membership organizations are extremely important to our profession. Whether their value is in community or continuing education or advocacy or something as simple as buying power. I encourage everyone to seek out ways to become involved. Whether that's FPA or it's NAPFA or it's both, seek out ways to become involved with your membership organization. CFP Board and FPA were involved in the process that led to the Department of Labor's new fiduciary rule. Blaine, what can you share with us about the status of the rule? Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, the coalition definitely invested a lot of energy and, and hard work this past year on our continuing advocacy in support of providing financial advice under a fiduciary standard. The CFP Board and the Financial Planning Coalition expressed support for the DOL's proposed rule, given the many ways in it will benefit and protect Americans saving for retirement. Our work on this is connected to that long-term goal of recognition and regulation of financial planners that Mike referred to. This is a goal that we share with our partners in the Financial po uh, Planning Coalition, the uh, Financial Planning Association, as well as NAPFA. 
the coalition has been very engaged throughout the rulemaking process, and we can take a little closer look at that. So last July, we filed a joint comment letter with the FPA and NAPFA, and in that letter, we voiced uh, strong support for the Department of Labor's reproposed rule that amends the definition of fiduciary advice under ERISA. And we also propose changes to streamline the rule and make it more operational across the various business models. The DOL received an enormous amount of feedback uh, from the industry during the two public comment periods uh, during this particular rulemaking. As you can see here in this slide, the range and volume of work of the Financial Planning Coalition uh, performed on this rule was extremely expensive, extensive. We spoke from experience, citing the experience of our CFP professionals who since 2007 have been required to provide financial planning services under a fiduciary standard. And in, in many ways, the CFP certificates needed to act in a manner much like what's required under the best interest contract exemption in the DOL's final rule. Ours was clearly an influential voice in the debate, and in recognition of our support and advocacy, the coalition was invited by the Secretary of Labor to participate in the release event just this last April. And Secretary Perez specifically recognized CFP professionals in interviews since the release of the rule. So we believe the final rule maintains the, the core principles of a strong fiduciary standard, but also reflects an appropriate balance between establishing needed consumer reform and making the rule more operational for advisors. So the DOL rule, uh, the DOL did make important changes to the rule that did help to make it much more operational across the business models. And many of those changes were recommended by the coalition in our comment letter. So for example, the final rule distinguishes between education and fiduciary advice. It also includes significant changes to the best interest contract exemption that simplify the contracting period uh, and that whole process that streamlines disclosures and record keeping requirements, and it clarifies that commissions can be received and proprietary products can be recommended. So we were very pleased with the, following the release of the final rule that many major firms have, in fact, applauded the DOL for making meaningful changes in that final rule, and, it, and they've really switched from opposing the rule to implementing it. And as you know, there, there was a lot of opposition, and there are still uh, likely congressional and legal challenges to the final rule, uh, but the fiduciary standard and disclosure requirements of the final rule are similar to the requirements of the CFP, that CFP board has established in its CFP professionals for the, the professionals when uh, they're providing financial planning services. And that happens through our standards of professional conduct. So overall, I'd say the, the coalition is extremely confident that CFP professionals can be leaders in embracing the fiduciary obligations that are embodied in the, in the DOL's final rule. Glenn, thank you for that update. I understand that CFP board is also looking at its own standards. Kevin, what updates can you share about the work of the Commission on Standards? Tom, thank you so much, and it's, it's good, good to be here with you today, and I appreciate you taking time out of your, away from your practice to help us with this business update webinar. CFP Board's professional standards really are at the core of CFP certification. These standards uh, differentiate our certification from other financial services designations, and I think they uh, instill trust and confidence not only in the public, but also, I think, in policymakers and the consumer finance press. In December, we announced the creation of a new commission on standards, and that group is charged with reviewing and recommending proposed changes to our standards, and they will make that recommendation to our board of directors. Specifically, the commission will be looking at our code of ethics, the rules of conduct, the practice standards, and the terminology uh, of, the defi of the terminology used in the various documents. CFP Board conducts periodic reviews of all of our requirements, 
and standards related to certification to ensure that they remain strong and relevant. The last major update of the standards of professional conduct was adopted way back in May of 2007. A lot has happened since that time, so this review is very important. We've uh, <clears throat> assembled what I think is a, a, a top-notch group to conduct this review. Ray Ferrara, our former board chair and former chair of our Disciplinary and Ethics Commission, is serving as the chair of the Commission on Standards. We have a very qualified and diverse group on the Commission. It includes CFP professionals representing, I think, just every business model uh, 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 of practice. We have individuals with regulatory experience. We have a consumer advocate and public member representation as well. The Commission's work is taking place within a well-defined, and I would tell you it's an intentionally deliberate plan. Input from the profession and the public is going to be vital to the work of the Commission. The process that we've set out features opportunities for input from both the public and the certificate community, uh, both before the Commission really begins the heavy work, and then once the Board uh, has a proposal, we'll be back out to, for comment and input. Earlier this year, we held nine public forums around the country to get input. And we appreciate everyone who came out and shared their thoughts with us. The Commission has a number of important issues to address. These range from the, even the basic structure of the standards to definitions of key terms like financial planning and fiduciary to requirements related to disclosures and conflicts of interest. Should the standards be principles-based or rules-based or maybe some combination of both? Should the standards retain the current structure made up of a number of separate documents, or is there a benefit to consolidating them into one document? And what is the appropriate standard of care for services provided by CFP professionals? As the Commission conducts its work over the next several months, we likely will not have much to say. In fact, uh, they're meeting in committees and subcommittees. There are seven separate subcommittees, and they're, they're doing their work. And the process is once they have uh, a proposal, they will bring it to our board of directors. And once our board of directors is satisfied that it's ready to go out for public comment, that will happen. But that will likely not happen in 2016. We see that probably happening in 2017. Well, thank you, Kevin. These are important issues, and it's great to see the process for addressing them it includes input from persons across our professional community. The CFP Board has made quite a few announcements recently focused on our new Center for Financial Planning. Mike, what updates can you share about that new center? Um, thank you. Uh, all the work of CFP Board is important, but I have to tell you, this is my personal favorite topic to receive updates on, to continue to provide uh, input on. We're lucky enough to have the Executive Director, Marilyn Mormon Gillis, with us here today. Um, I'll share a few thoughts, and uh, this is just a very, very exciting time for us. So the CFP Board's Center for Financial Planning is a strategy we use to um, capitalize on the unique position of CFP Board, the ability to bring people and organizations together, convener and catalyst, we like to say, that address the major issues that uh, affect our profession. There is no doubt that the American public's need for personal financial advice is greater than ever, as historically high numbers of Americans are going into retirement. Now, we've seen continued growth in the number of CFP professionals, but the broader universe of financial planning professionals has actually been shrinking. It's a well-known fact that is cited uh, at industry conferences regularly. This is a significant issue for the future of the profession and the financial health of the American public. So the center's mission is focused on collectively strengthening the profession 
by advancing a diverse and sustainable workforce and a research-based body of knowledge. Our vision is to secure all Americans' financial future through a more inclusive and sustainable financial planning profession. This is something that CFP Board cannot do alone. I emphasize that on purpose. We cannot do this alone. But we're in that unique position to be able to pull a variety of different groups together to serve as convener and catalyst. Now, the center will conduct research on issues that affect the profession and serve as a resource for educators, practitioners, researchers, financial services firm, and the public. Starting out, the center has identified three main areas of focus. Workforce development, diversity, and an academic home or body of knowledge. Workforce development, we mean attract and develop the next generation of financial planning professionals who have the knowledge and skills to competently and ethically, a phrase, Kevin, I hear you use frequently, competent and ethical, to serve the public while bringing innovative research techniques and approaches to advance the practice of financial planning. Diversity. We need to address the lack of gender and racial diversity within the financial planning profession so that we can meet the growing and increasingly diverse needs of the American consumer. Now, building an academic home means that we want to fuel the growth and elevate the caliber of talent, continue to increase that level of talent as we build a pipeline from existing registered programs as well as new top colleges and universities. And this we hope to accomplish by creating an academic home for faculty, both from the financial planning profession and related disciplines that offer more unique opportunities for research and the ability to publish. And we've done a lot of work to lay the groundwork over the last couple of years set up a successful and sustainable center for the long term. So in January, the center held a design summit, and I think at the last uh, um, briefing we had a, a quick opportunity to share some of the thoughts from this. 42 leading thought leaders come together in this idea of convening folks together to discuss what should be the strategic direction for the center. The participants, executives from major firms and independent advisory firms, academic leaders, researchers, CFP professionals, and representatives from other associations, such as the National Urban League and the National Council of La, Ra La Raza. It was the input from these discussions that are being put together to drive the programmatic timeline for the center, that's short and long term and to identify candidates for the Center's Advisory Council and Development Committee. I'm looking at a copy of a recently published report that memorializes these incredible discussions at the Design Summit that map out our strategies for addressing those priorities. That include, just a reminder for everyone here, three key priorities, attracting the next generation of financial planners to replace those who will be retiring improve the diversity of the workforce to more closely mirror the public, and finally, establishing an academic home to build a research-based body of knowledge for financial planning. So here's how we see the center approaching diversity. It builds off the great work that people across the profession have done for many years. We're working on a Faces and Voices campaign that will showcase the profession the financial planning profession as a great place for women, millennials, and racially diverse leaders. CFP Board's Women Initiative, which we kicked off several years ago, given us a head start on diversity, but again, building off efforts that others have had in place for many years. The center is following up on those recommendations from the outline of the white paper that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with and is available on the website. Now this research to solutions model that we used for the women's initiative is providing us a map forward, a route forward on racial diversity. And that's what we'll be doing. We're going to establish a racial diversity advisory group 
conduct the research, and from that, publish our findings and recommendations in a white paper. Now, for workforce development, our primary goal this year is focused on supporting pilot projects. These are successful, successful programs in other industries that we want to pilot and bring here. And I love this model of finding success and applying it to our profession. And in this case, we want to establish a re-entry internship for experienced professionals seeking to return to the workforce who want to work with financial planning or a financial services firm. The Career Center connects financial services firms of all sizes, and we see the growth in that every month, Kevin, and we continue to hear stories of what's come out of the Career Center. And we're working on connecting professionals who hold or are pursuing CFP certification, and it provides resources for both the job seeker and those who have employment opportunities. Mike, I like to say we're making a market for financial advice and financial planners. And, you know, we had a, one of our board members you know, commented. He, it was almost like he was surprised. He's like, gee, you have this resource. I used it. Now, he said I got fewer actual resumes than I got from Monster or other services, but they were all highly qualified. So I think I thought that was uh, insightful and appreciated, appreciated his feedback. And interestingly, at the break right after that, I had another board member who came to me with the exact same story saying that uh, um, she had just hired someone through the Career Center as well, and it's working well. You know, we, we should uh, recognize our, our friends at Fidelity who really had the vision with us to uh, establish the Career Center as the founding sponsor of the Career Center and thank them for helping make the, the resource available. That is right on. The third element under workforce development is establish mentorship and scholarship programs. And Marilyn, every time you tell me about the next one that has come up, I just continue to get a smile on my face and thinking about the momentum that is building in this area. So hats off to what you have done in the area of workforce development. Now, with an academic home, our goal in 16 is focused on establishing a website for the financial planning body of knowledge. It's a searchable database of that research. Now we look forward to hosting the first international academic research colloquium for financial planning and related disciplines. We're developing this in conjunction with the international, the Financial Planning Standards Board, that is the CFP organization outside the United States, as well as the Financial Planning Standards Council, our, uh, our close friends and colleagues in Canada. Mike, you know, there's, there's an important point there, I think, if we could take just one second. And that is the, the, the real vision of the, of the center is that we're not doing these things alone, that we're collaborating with other organizations. We're, as you said, collaborating, convening groups. But this is a prime example where uh, we're working together with other organizations, and, you know, we welcome that opportunity. I think it's absolutely fantastic. We're also excited to be working with Columbia University on a new program to help get more qualified faculty. And Kevin, you've, you've taught me about this, how crucial it is to have qualified faculty and enough qualified faculty to staff baccalaureate programs all across the country. And this really builds on the vision of people many years ago who started with an initial grant at one university that spawned PhDs and now we need more because the need is growing every single year. Kevin, anything you want to add? Well, to that just that you know, it was it, CFP board took the leadership role back in 2002, 2003, and made an initial grant that established the PhD program at Texas Tech. And though they have uh, graduates, undergraduate, masters, and PhD folks all across the country now. So I, I think this lays out in, in pretty good detail where we're headed with the center. And I want to reemphasize something Kevin said and, and uh, maybe give Marilyn just a moment if there's anything she'd like to add in this. But the work of the center cannot be done by one organization alone. This is a consortium of more than just the financial planning profession. 
more than just the membership organizations or the traditional financial services firms. We're going to reach well beyond that in order to continue to grow and build what we're up to here. And I'd, I'd urge everyone to take a look at the center's website to learn more about the center. I think we'll be able to see right there on the, uh, on the slide where you can take a, a look. Marilyn, is there anything you'd like to add at this point? Mike, you did such a great job of explaining the center. Uh, I, uh, nothing, nothing to add other than we just really encourage everyone to learn about the center, uh, to become involved in the center, and we're very excited about this initiative. So I, uh, I always feel like I'm stealing Marilyn's thunder when I get a chance to brief this, but I'm so excited about where we're going with this. And I want you to learn about the center, and I want you to be involved with the center. Um, Kevin, I know that uh, we continue to do great development work here. You've probably got an ask. Well, we do, we, but there are many ways that uh, you can contribute to the center. Uh, we, we say uh, we're looking for contributions of time, talent, and or treasure. So again, there's more information available on the website financialplanningcenter.org. You know, we, um, uh, as we think about the work of the center, we recently launched a new mentorship program as part of our women's initiative. We call the women's initiative WIN. Uh, and the goal there is to increase the number of women CFP professionals. The new mentorship program, which we call WIN to WIN, a very American viewpoint, huh, Mike, is connecting women who are on the path to becoming CFP professionals with current CFP professionals who can offer encouragement, advice, and wisdom. We are grateful for the WIN advocates and others who have already committed to participating in this mentorship program. Uh, and you do not need to be a female to be a mentor. We have a number of men who have signed up to be uh, win-to-win mentors. So more information is available at cfp.net slash win mentor. We also recently announced the first online career fair through the CFP Board Career Center. On September 13th, we will be bringing job seekers together with financial services employers for one-on-one, -on -one text-based, and video chats. This is a great venue to find new talent and to promote opportunities within your organization. I encourage everyone to make sure that your firm's hiring staff or HR department is aware of this great opportunity to find new financial planning talent. Well, we've covered a lot of material this afternoon. Now we get to turn our program over to questions that we've had from our listeners. And the first one is all for you, Blaine. Okay. Russell asks, will CFP board have resources and interpretation of DOL rule to help CFP professionals stay in compliance and implement that rule? Yes, uh, certainly so. I, I will say that we're looking primarily to the DOL uh, for interpretation of the rule. But nevertheless, CFP board and the coalition partners do provide resources to help everyone understand uh, the rule's impact. And in fact, later this month, on July 21st, the Financial Planning Coalition is hosting a webinar with an ERISA expert to discuss the impact of the rule uh, on financial planning practitioners. So you can find information about the webinar on the Coalition website, uh, as well as on CFP Board's website. Also, I want to mention that the Coalition noted in our comment letters to the DOL that that best interest contract part of the DOL rule is very similar to those that are applicable in, to CFP professionals uh, in our standards of professional conduct. So you can also find uh, compliance resources uh, on our standards on CFP Board's website at www.cfp.net slash compliance. Well, Mike, the next question is for you, and it's from Alexis, who asks, 
How does the CFP board plan to maintain the public's respect and knowledge about the designation to discern and hopefully elevate it above the alphabet soup of other designations for financial advisors? Alexis, um, thank you for this question. It's one that we talk about at board meetings on a regular basis, this idea that there are a whole host of initials that the cons consumer sees on a daily basis. And it, it can be very difficult to understand um, what's out there and what means something significant for their financial planning uh, of life. We believe that CFP does set the highest standard for competent and ethical personal financial planning. And we've got a number of initiatives that are ongoing to highlight the importance of CFP certification for consumers. There's, of course, the paid advertising that I talked about a little bit earlier. Our public awareness campaign is effective, but it's being supplemented by strong earned media. This is where we aren't paying, but um, media is writing about us on their own. Our consumer advocate, Eleanor Blaney, along with a team, and it's a broad team of CFP board ambassadors across the country who are out there reaching out to consumer-facing media to make sure that the public receives the information about what makes CFP unique and the highest standard for personal financial planning. Mike, we have 50 CFP board ambassadors all across all across the country. So it's, uh, I think it's, a, it's a quite an army out there spreading the word. Great question. Blaine, we have another question that's directed at you, and it's from Russell. Russell has not been as excited, apparently, about the DJ ads as some others, and he's hoping the next marketing campaign will be a little bit different. What, could you address that? Well, I guess we would collectively say we're sorry you didn't like it, uh, <laughs> Russell. Uh, but overall, and I, I think we have to say that the reception for the ad has been uh, very positive among CFP professionals, and even more importantly, uh, it seems to be a hit with consumers. That you know we've seen good results uh, from the ad. That's something that we track very closely to see how uh, what the level of success in the public awareness campaign is. And our brand tracking studies have found that awareness among our target market has in fact doubled since the campaign started. And since we introduced the DJ ad, it has increased a full 10 percentage points. So, uh, you know, this fall we'll be running the DJ ad again <laughs> for, I'm sorry, Russell, uh, for our second TV advertising uh, run of the year. Uh, but our marketing teams are looking at the development of uh, new ads and uh, new creative that will be introduced in 2017. Thank you. Well, Kevin, uh, another question here, this one from William, who asked about the marketing campaign as well. He asked, what is the marketing message going to be from the CFP board now that there's been a change in fiduciary standards for professionals providing investment advice? Well, Tom, you know, as Blaine mentioned, our marketing teams are looking at the possibility of updating the creative for the public awareness campaign for next year. This year, we're continuing the message that CFP certification is the highest standard. That includes highlighting the fiduciary standard for CFP professionals when providing financial planning. While fiduciary is now in the vocabulary of nearly everyone in the financial services industry, thanks to the DOL's rulemaking, it is not uh, always a familiar term for the public. The fiduciary standard for CFP professionals is still meaningful and sets CFP professionals apart from many other folks in the financial services industry. Well, gentlemen, we're beginning to get questions in from our audience. Uh, Christy DeBurr has one for you, Kevin. She asks, what is the percentage of women versus men holding the CFP designation? Well, Christy, thank you for that question. I wish I had better news to report. That percentage is 23%, and it has been that the same percentage for over a decade. Now, we have good news. Uh, you should know, Christy, that the Board of Directors is holding the staff accountable 
for growing that percentage. And to that end, for the July exam that starts next week, we have 30% of the exam candidates registered are females. So we're making progress, but it is, it is slower than we would like. And part of the reason that we launched the Center for Financial Planning to help grow the gender diversity as well as racial and ethnic diversity as well among the CFP community. I'm going to just tag on to this answer real quickly because um, I think it's important for folks to know that uh, um, the board of directors takes this issue very seriously. And when we lay out the goals for Kevin and his team, we actually have an increased goal for the growth rate of women CFP certificates than we do over the general population. So um, it isn't just wishful thinking on our part. We're laying out specific goals that we hold Kevin and team accountable for and hence ourselves accountable to to make sure that uh, we do directly address this. You know, we might also add the efforts of the coalition partners that have really been uh, active in this area as well. So it, it's a great opportunity for us to work together uh, in this important area. Right on. That's great for you to say because in FBA Illinois, we have a blossoming membership of female uh, advisors. So if, if you want to move to Illinois, Christy, we'd be happy to have you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Benjamin has a question for you, Kevin, about the win-to-win -win mentoring opportunity and wonder, wondering if that's part of our Mentor Match program. Um, I, of, of whose Mentor Match program? F oh, I'm sorry, FPA. My gosh, did I miss that? <laughs> that's terrible. You know, uh, the win-to-win -win mentor program is designed specifically to uh, match women uh, candidates for CFP certification with those who are already certified. As Mike said earlier, uh, Lauren Shadle and her team from FPA are coming to DC this weekend and we'll be with them on Monday. So we, we uh, look forward to uh, discussing opportunities to collaborate together on this important goal. Glenn has a question. I'm involved as an alumnus from a major state university that does not have a financial planning degree. What is the best way to get them to have that? <laughs> oh, there it is down there. Okay. Best way for this university's career services area, the Center for Financial Planning to get student jobs at planning firms. So I'll answer this generically and then I think I'm going to ask have to reach out with the specifics on this one so that we get um, contact information out to uh, Glenn on this one. Um, Glenn, thank you because we are always trying to grow the number of uh, um, avenues that young people can find into firms. And although we have a growing number of undergraduate degree programs, in your particular case we don't. And so if you would reach out to the staff at the Center for Financial Planning specifically. Um, Marilyn, do you have a name that you'd like to share to reach out to? Right, Dr. Charles Chapin. So we will make sure that you uh, get his contact information. At the and Dr. Dr. Charles is a fantastic person and I know that you will uh, get action very quickly because I had a very similar question um, from someone in my own firm maybe a month ago and two days later, they returned and said, boom, we're already signed up. So Glenn, thank you for that. And I hope other folks who are out there who have connections to universities can reach out as well and connect with uh, Dr. Charles and the, uh, and the center. Okay. Kevin, we have one for you from Sharon. She is um, wondering about an educators meeting at Columbia in August and if the expanded event in February will take the place of that? No, in fact, they are two separate initiatives. So the, the opportunity at Columbia University, this is a Columbia teaching certificate. Now we envision, this, this, think about this. So we have um, practitioners, financial planning practitioners, who might like to be adjunct faculty, but don't really have a solid uh, teaching 
background. So this program is designed for them. It's also designed for people who might be finance faculty already in a college or university but don't have experience teaching financial planning. We don't have a date on that, but uh, again, Dr. Charles Chafin is the contact at CFP board. Now, the February program is our academic research colloquium. It's a different initiative. It is February 5 through 7 in 2017. It'll be in Arlington, Virginia, right by National Airport in actually Crystal City. So we're very excited about both of these new initiatives. And we think uh, they go a long way toward helping CFP certification and financial planning emerge more fully as a recognized profession. Benjamin asked you, Kevin, about our partnering with international organizations and wonders if there are discussions about helping advisors who are interested in cross-border planning better help them navigate how to secure the right to use the CFP marks in multiple countries. Well, is this, is this our friend Dr. Benjamin Cummings? Uh, ben, by the way, nice to see you, Ben. Ben was a scholar in residence at CFP board a few years ago, and we're so happy, Ben, for your success. Um, because the CFP certification is a trademark, each of the 26 territories that offer CFP certification have the right to issue that certification for use only in that territory. So if you have a more specific question, Ben, happy to reach out. Give our office a call. Give me a call, and I'll, I'll help you get the answer to that. But the bottom line is different countries have different cross-border uh, requirements. I will tell you, though, that it is a major topic of discussion at our international meetings because uh, of, you know, of the uh, number of CFP professionals who are practicing in multiple locations. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we have another question about our diversity initiatives from Sun Jin, and they're wondering what the uh, benchmark is for the ratio of African American and non-Hispanic white certificates. It's abysmal, Tom. I'll be that direct. Now, we don't, we, first of all, that is a voluntary piece of data that people offer on our website, in our database. When you're, it's not a mandatory. So about 75% of the CFP community have given us data. And of those who have told us uh, or have identified race, the combination of African Americans, Hispanic identifying individuals, and Asian Americans is less than 5% total. By the way, I don't think uh, I don't think that we are that far off from the financial services population as a whole, but it doesn't make it any more acceptable. And I think this underscores the importance, I'm so happy for that question, because it underscores the importance of the center's work. So I'm not going to steal any of, of Maryland's thunder, but in future meetings you're going to hear more about what we're doing on the areas of racial diversity. I talked about it very briefly, um, but we've got some um, very, very interesting initial conversations going, going on with organizations that want to continue to promote and build racial diversity among financial planners so that we can more closely mirror our American public. Thanks, Tom. Well, we are just about out of time. Uh, Mike, what closing thoughts would you have to leave with us? Well, of course, thanks to everyone who took the time to dial in today. Um, thank you to you, Tom. As Kevin said, this means you're stepping out of your business to come and spend uh, time with us. And uh, we're in Chicago. We know what traffic is like. So effectively, this makes a full day out for you. Um, I want to reiterate that CFP Board's mission is one that we just cannot achieve alone. We achieve this through collaboration and cooperation. We're extremely grateful for all of the different people who have helped us contribute contributed along the way 
whether those are CFP certificates or others in the profession. Um, we've come a long way since CFP Board was established nearly 30 years ago. In fact, we celebrated that anniversary at last year's FPAB conference, so we're nearing 31 years at this point. And that's the direct result of tens of thousands of professionals who have embodied and who reflect the competency and ethical standards in their daily work with clients. It's the dedicated leadership of our volunteers. And we shouldn't forget to mention the staff at CFP Board. There are, I think, just shy of 70 folks there who all day long help to make it possible for us to keep these marks. So I appreciate everyone's engagement with the Board and your support for our goals. Mike, uh, just let me echo your remarks uh, and share my thanks to the CFP professional community uh, and those who support it in so many ways. I also want to encourage everyone to consider how they can support the important work of the Center for Financial Planning. I mean, that's something we spent a good deal of time on today, and, and importantly so. The Center has outlined an ambitious agenda to build capacity for the profession and to build an academic home for the profession that really does advance the profession's body of knowledge. So any support that the listeners uh, can give to the Center for Financial Planning really will make a difference and support the important research, advocacy, education, and workforce development initiatives that, that really will advance the profession. So uh, I invite everyone to please take a look at the Center's website to learn more about the Center and consider how they can get involved. You know, Tom, I would like to recognize both Mike and Blaine and the rest of the Board of Directors for their leadership. Uh, I, th I believe philosophically that the only way a staff can be successful is if you have clarity in what the expectations are from the Board of Directors. I view my role as uh, aligning the financial and the staff resources of the organization to achieve the board's goals. And they've, they've, they speak with great clarity, and so that makes our job easier, having that clarity. Uh, we have a lot of important initiatives underway at CFP Board. I hope uh, the folks on the line today will get in touch with us uh, when you can to contribute to any one of our initiatives. Or if you have new ideas you think we should be looking at, please let us know that too. Well, thank you all for sharing this update on our CFP Board's work, and to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. A recording of this presentation will be posted to CFP Board's website within the next week, and CFP Board will follow up with those who ask questions we did not have time to address during this broadcast. Thank you. Have a great weekend.